Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2014 with another Watchman video broadcast. Now, I keep looking in here hoping I'll find a taco. There's no taco. The only thing I see is like the bloody remnants of some taco sauce down inside this bag here. Anyway, another taco from Del Taco. I'm not just up here playing. I have, there's a reason for my madness here. We've been talking about the elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Uh, some things God is showing us from the scriptures. And I hope to just kind of show you what all of this is all about. See, you're supposed to get the Del Taco bag and the plastic bag, which is dangerous for children three and under. And uh, so you're supposed to throw it away. And you dump out all of this stuff here. And you have the elements of, that would be fire. This would be water, because it's blue, because everybody knows water is blue. And this would be earth, because it's green. And uh, Al Gore invented this, by the way. And then we have air. And what you're supposed to do is that you dump all this stuff out of the bag. And you're supposed to, kids already, they don't need the instructions. They know that you're supposed to take all this and you're supposed to put it together because all of the pieces, all of the elements are scattered out and they need to be put together so that you can form, let me get the last piece in here, this would be water because it's blue, it must be from the tidy bowl man. And then you're supposed to put the head on it. This is my version of the Terra Man, or as it's referred to in the scriptures as the man of sin, the son of perdition. I'm going to show you this. I'm going to show you, show, been showing you what the Bible says, and I'm going to show you more of what the Bible says about all this. This is really going to deal with the idea of gathering all of these loose pieces together so that this guy can come out of it. You've seen our illustration before on what the elements are all about. They're all about gathering everything together. Let's back up just a few places in the scripture from where we left off last week. Revelation chapter 17, this was something that God had just showed me last week. And I'm gonna use that as a launching board to launch off into some things that hopefully all of this will make sense. Hopefully you'll see it. Revelation 17, 15, he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are, let's count, peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Very, very interesting that that fourth one is different than the other three. You have peoples, multitudes, nations, that has to do with human bodies, even with nations has the idea of, even though they have little different genetics in them, we're going to see that from the scriptures. Peoples, multitudes, and nations. But then we have tongues. Think about that. Think about something in the Bible where tongues were scattered all over the place. We're going to go there in just a few minutes. So we have the four. We have, we have um, oh, let's say this would be peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the whore sitteth on these. These are the waters that the beast rises up out of. Remember, we go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 9, and God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and notice the language of the of this King James Bible, gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. So the gathering together of the waters peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, the gathering together of the waters he calls seas. So we go to Revelation 13, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Here we go. Here we have the four elements that, were, that are the waters gathered together, and the beast rises up out of those four. It's telling you in black and white, Sometimes it's red if Jesus says it. It's telling you right there in the scriptures exactly what this represents. You, you arm yourself. You read this book. You study it. 
you let God show you these things, and next time you go into Taco Bell and they say, here, would you like a kid's meal for your child? You say, no, no way, get away from me. You're not giving me that stuff, okay? Unless you're going to send it to me with a taco in it. I don't think it would make the trip unless you live, you know, like next door or something like that. But anyway, uh, let me show you this illustration that I put together. We have the four elements, f four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. They match and represent what peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues really are. Down at our core, at our very, the very fiber of our being, we are four bases. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. So you see how this works here. The four elements represent the four base pairs of our DNA. Adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. And they are all opposites to one another. So we took that verse out of um, Deuteronomy 7. Do not let your son marry their daughter. Do not let your daughter marry their son. Don't bring these opposites Together, like in Daniel chapter 2, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Don't do that. But that's exactly what they did. Notice this. We, we see it. We're going to kind of go back a little bit so we can launch forward here. In the great seal of the United States, you, ha you do have those opposites there. Notice the eagle, the spread eagle. Notice in one talon he has arrows for war. Notice in the other talon he has olive branch for peace. Why? Those are opposites and yet they are joined together in the exact same body, the left wing and the right wing. Look at it. Does that, does that kind of make sense now? Because even the halls of our Congress are divided by left wing and right wing. And all of these politicians, they all want to say, oh, we, we're just going to work together. We're going to reach across the aisle and work with our partners on the other side, on the left wing, on the right wing. We're going to come together and make this nation strong again. What, what is our motto? Out of many, unum, unum, e pluribus, out of plural, out of many, one. That's our motto in this nation. What does it mean? Now we're sort of getting an understanding. I know it quept us. Look at the pyramid. The pyramid with the, the four sides on it, and they represent the elements. They're pointing in four different directions, north, south, east, and west, winter, summer, fall, and spring, and yet they rise and they join together at the top so that the head could be set in place. You cannot put the capstone on top of the pyramid until you build the pyramid. Doesn't that make sense? In other words, everybody has to come together before this guy can be the Lord. Now that is the exact opposite of Bible Christianity. Bible Christianity, Jesus says, I'm already the Lord. I don't need everybody to come together so I can be the capstone. He's not the capstone. He is already the Lord, and He is the one who brings everybody together. We're going to see those places in scriptures. Now, I want you to watch this. We're going to go back, and we're going to look at, look at this pyramid for a minute here. This pyramid, it basically, it represents, it kind of looks like the Tower of Babel. It's meant to, and I'll show you that here in a little bit. But this pyramid is the unfinished pyramid. Now, all of these stones have been brought together because they represented the scattered Peoples, nations, multitudes, and tongues of the world. They've been all scattered all over the earth. The New World Order says, Novus Order Seclorum, let's bring them together so that our guy can be the Lord, the capstone over all of them, even if he only has one eye. It's okay. One eye is better than none. So that's the concept. How did all of these people, peoples, nations, multitudes, and tongues, how did they get scattered to begin with? The Bible has the answer. So Genesis chapter 10. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. Then you look at verse 32. These are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generations, in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. And, if, and to me it's just interesting, and I don't think it's an accident, 
that Genesis chapter 10 has 32 divisions in it, has 32 verses in it. Does that number kind of sound familiar to anybody? If it doesn't, wait till you see what I'm going to show you at the end of this, because I promise you, it, you'll go, boing, I get it, I get it. God has an order in his word, and through that order, he is teaching us what these guys don't want you to know, because it's a secret, it's a mystery religion. She is sitting on it and hiding it from everybody. God says, whatever they're hiding, I'm going to reveal it to everybody. So there's an order to the Bible. Genesis 10, you happen to have the nations of the world. There are, let me say it like this, there's a certain number of these families in Genesis chapter 10. If you've heard me mention it before, then you don't need me to say it now. But I'm going to wait. I'm going to hold off on that part. And following this video, I'm going to start work on a, I'm just going to kind of unhook the train a little bit from the fourth kingdom. It'll still be related to it. But I'm going to deal with the great seal of the United States and what it represents. And what, what connection Genesis 10 has with the stones on that pyramid. I'm going to show you the connection because there's the number and there's an idea there. And I'm going to give you part of it now. Here we have collected in 32 divisions, 32 uh, degrees, 32 levels, 32 verses is an enumeration of all of the families of the earth. They were born from one man, Noah, who had three sons, by the way. Um, anthropologists will tell you that there have been and is right now three primary races of men. There is, and I'm going to use these words, and it's not meant to cast any racial profile on anybody, Mongoloid, Caucasoid, and Negroid. And as I say those three words, automatically you should say, yeah, there's, you know, you know Eastern Oriental people, and there's uh, there is white people, and then there is Negro people or black people, and there are three primary races. And then what you have underneath that are like sub-races, which are combinations of two or even all three that make up mankind. But then they're divided down into all their separate families in Genesis chapter 10. So they're all pretty much together as of this point. Then something happens. We look in Genesis 11, because it says, and the, notice the language here, the whole earth was of one language and one speech. So we stop right here. So we have all of the nations of the world, all of the families come out of one man, and they're all together, and they all sprechen the same Deutsch, all right? They all speak the same language. And they're all together in the valley of Shinar, which is what they call Sumeria. Here's what they wanted to do. There was, there was something common amongst all of them. And they had a goal. They had an agenda. We want to be one people. We don't want to be scattered all over the place. We're going to be one people. There was a, there was a spirit in them that was saying this inside. And look at what it says. They said one to another, go to let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. You see their agenda. They want oneness. Let's build this tower that will reach into heaven. There was a spirit in them driving them to build this tower of ascendancy. Freemasonry has it. Witchcraft has it. Just about every religion in the world has, other than Bible Christianity, has some sort of idea that you ascend to heaven by stages, by levels, by layers, by initiations, by rituals. And I say all of them except Bible Christianity because Bible Christianity says if you're saved, you go to heaven. Just like one step and you're there. But all these guys have, and witchcraft, and the Kabbalah. Oh my goodness, the Kabbalah, probably the most confusing religion that mankind ever came up with is Jewish Kabbalah. No wonder. And God turned the Jews over to utter confusion. And if you try to follow their religion, you're just going... Uh, you, this, this, and you, you have no idea what it's talking about. 
But get this concept, because I'm going to show you what happened here. But here's what happened, all right? Here's what happened. God looked at everybody. They were all together, all the families, all the tribes, all the nations, all the multitudes, the whole tongue. They were all speaking one language, and they were all trying to build this one tower, this one world tower. That's what they were trying to do. And God said, I've got to put a stop to this because they're using their imagination. And if they get together and use their imagination, there's not anything that's not going to be possible to them. And I can tell you right now, we are living in a world right now that is being run by the collective imagination of people in this world. And literally, we are inventing our way into the new world order because of people's imagination. Remember Star Trek? You watch Star Trek, watch Star Wars, watch any kind of science fiction 30, 40 years ago. Scientists are teaching themselves how to do that right now. I think they have a spirit that's getting them there rather quickly. That's what I think. That's what the spirit, the spirit was doing that back in the days of Genesis 11, and that same spirit is doing it now. What is it? It's the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience teaching mankind to use his imagination to dream up of ways of ascendancy, taking man from earth to heaven. That's what it's all about. So look at what God did, Genesis 11. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. I'm, I'm going to show you something, then I'm going to explain this. I'm going to show you something that came up on my screen. I got Windows 8.1 on a computer, and I was looking, you know, just kind of see through the app store what they had, and I saw this video game. It's called Babel Rising. And oh, look what it says. Only a God can rise to the challenge. Express your wrath against insolent workers led and strengthened by protective priests, Sacred urn porters, siege towers that help humans to access upper levels faster, cargo ships bringing stone to the yard, control the elements, access twice as many powers as in the original game. Learn elemental attacks based on fire, water, earth, and air. So you're the god in this game that learns to control earth, air, fire, and water. If you don't think there is a conspiracy to train and educate people all over the world to practice witchcraft. Think again. It's in Del Taco. It's in video games. It's everywhere teaching people how to use the elements. Think of, just do a Google search, of how many products in the world are called element or elements or elemental. How many of them? Dozens, scores, hundreds? Could be an endless number. Why? Teaching people how to use these things. But here's what God started doing. Genesis chapter 11. We're going to put some verses together. In Genesis 11, we see that God divided the people. First of all, Genesis 10, we see them sort of divided up by family line, by bloodline, by nation, by ancestry, by subtle differences in their DNA. Then Genesis 11 comes around, and God divides them by their language. Probably their language ran along with a certain ethnic group. In other words, here was this family from the line of Japheth, and all of a sudden, they're speaking this way, and everybody else is going, what in the world are they saying? And the other guy's going, blah, 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 blah. I don't know what he's saying. But they're all babbling to one another. So now, naturally, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? This family, from this particular ancestry, from this particular tribe, who only speaks this dialect, they are going to come together and separate from all of the other people, aren't they? That's just a natural, natural thing. God, God knew what he was doing. So they separated out by their ancestry, by their family, and by their language. And they really, it's pointless to go hang around everybody else because they're talking and telling jokes and you're going, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. And they're probably talking and telling jokes about you and you don't know it. So you separate over here with your group and your people who speak your language. 
See how, see how simple this is? But then watch this. God's already got them divided by ancestry. He's got them now divided by language. And then God's going to kick it in gear. He's going to bring it up a notch. He's going to take those people from these tribes who speak this language. And all of a sudden, they're going to go floating away halfway across the world. Let me show you that in the scriptures. Genesis chapter 10, verse 25. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. For in his days was the earth divided. And his brother's name was Joktan. Did you see that? And, I mean, look at the picture, okay? It's just more than coincidence with me that North and South America can fit right into Africa and Europe. Just more than coincidence. I think, according to Scripture, I think God divided the dry land, the dry land, from the sea. That's what I think. I think there was one land mass, and all of the nations and peoples and tribes and DNA groups were all there. And then at the Tower of Babel, God divided them by family, divided them by language, and then he went and divided the land masses apart from one another. So now, they're all scattered. So what's the goal of the New World Order? The goal of the New World Order is gather everybody back together to be the one. And I'm going to show you that. We're going to talk about how they're going to be gathered. All right? So watch this. We, and here's, here's a concept that we as Bible-believing Christians should already be very well educated on, very well trained on, because one of these days, one of these days, our Lord is going to appear in the skies. He's not going to crawl up out of a hole in the earth. He's going to come down from heaven. He's going to appear in the skies. And the sound of a trumpet is going to call, and all of God's people, dead or alive, are going to rise up and join with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Here's how it's described in the Scriptures, Matthew 24, 30. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Did you see the number four there? Isn't that neat? Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, by the way, by the way, Ezekiel preached in Ezekiel 37 to bones that were what? Scattered all over the place. And when he started prophesying to them, what did the bones do? The foot bone connected to the ankle bone, ankle bone connected to the shin bone, shin bone connected to the knee bone. They all started coming together, but they didn't, didn't have any, they weren't alive. So what did God tell him? The Son of Man... Speak unto the four winds, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and say, breathe, O winds, into this lifeless body. And so he prophesied to the four winds, and they breathe life into this body. And it stood up, and God said, this is the whole house of Israel. Isn't that neat? Okay? So just think about it. So he's going to gather together his elect. Think about, if you want a picture of it, go read Genesis 6 and 7. You know what you're going to find there? All of the animals, clean animals and unclean animals. According to Acts chapter 10, I think the clean animals represent the Jews, Israel. I think the unclean animals represent the Gentiles. Go read those and kind of put it together. And they're all gathered together where? In the ark. Isn't it interesting that the Jews and the Gentiles... How were they, how were the clean animals and the unclean animals saved during the days of Noah? The exact same way. By the, they were in the ark. Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So what's going to happen is the trumpet's going to sound and God is going to gather together his elect from the four winds, which represent the four gospels. John chapter 6, verse 11 Here's a pair. You've got to see this. This is so neat. Think of, think of what the number 12 means. 12 tribes. 
12 apostles. What did God do with the 12 tribes? He scattered them all over the earth. Why? Because of their disobedience. They didn't believe what God said, and they went off serving Baal all the time. So he went, boom, and scattered them all over the place. This is a prophecy. When you see this, you're going to get this. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. And when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled how many baskets? Twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. Did you see that? The twelve tribes being gathered together again that came from the five loaves. You know what I see in that? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Caught up together, that's a gathering word, with them in the clouds to, be, to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And I think when it's time for us to go up, Christ is going to gather his people. Israel together, 144,000. I love this. Now watch this. 2 Thessalonians 2. This is in direct relation to the appearance of the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So, let's put all this together here. We have a gathering that's going to take place. Christ is going to gather his people, the Gentiles, together in one body, so shall we ever be the Lord. I believe Israel is going to be gathered there, the lost fragments that are scattered, and the disciples, the disciples, God's people, gather them back together again, 12 baskets full so that none of them are what? What was that word he used? Lost. Now they're not lost anymore. Isn't that? I, just, I, love, I love the King James Bible. All right? You don't get this out of the book. I guarantee you, you won't get it out of the book. But then, here's, here's what else is going to happen too. A man of sin is going to be revealed at that time. How does that man of sin get revealed? That's where we're going to look. That's where the element witchcraft comes into play. John chapter 17, verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, he's not talking to the Pope, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Do you see that? They may be one as we are. Oh, I love this. Zechariah 14, 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day, and there shall be one Lord and his name, one. Do you know that was God's name? One. Revelation chapter 4. John said, to behold, behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. That's the King James. You know what the NIV says? Someone was sitting on the throne. Doesn't sound right, does it? Zechariah, uh, no, we already read that one. Ephesians 4, 4. There is one body. In fact, let's do this. Let's count the number of ones that we are seeing in the book of Ephesians. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, through you all, and in you all. Seven ones here, isn't it? That's seven days makes one week. Seven things here constitute the whole of God's kingdom. You have one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all. And I, I just love this. He, Jesus prayed that his people would be one. Did you know that it, if Jesus asked his Father to make us one, did you know that it is not our job to try to bring oneness to the church it's not our job jesus didn't pray to us to do it did he prayed to the father that god would do it and i promise you god will 
But here's what's happening. You see in Genesis 11, the opposite. They think that it must be through their own will and their own works that they be one. How many sermons, how many sermons have you heard from these coffee shop preacher eds that talk about how we all are to be in unity, how we all are to be in one. It, all people from, just drop the denominations, let's be the community church. How many of you heard like that? Where they talk about, let's just forget about what divides us and let's just worship Jesus as one, even our Roman Catholic brothers and our Mormon brothers and our Hindu brothers and our, by the way, Allah is the same God as our God and the Jewish God. Have you heard that one before? The guy from Hillsong just said that. I put that on Pastor Mike Online last week. They're all talking about how we are to build it as one. That's not what Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed, God, you do it. That way it's your work and not ours. See the difference? Bible Christianity is what God does. Witchcraft is what you do to become God. Now, I'm saying all this for a reason. Because here's what's going to happen. While Jesus, praying to the Father, and God is going to make all of his kingdom one, there's another, part, there's another element to this, and it's just the opposite. You have to do all the work to build the one. So let me show you where we're going with this. Matthew chapter 13, verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest... And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. You see what is happening here? And even Paul, even Paul said he matched the same thing. He said that day, our gathering together unto him, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. How is the man of sin going to be revealed? Because right now, he's scattered all over the place, isn't he? He's all messed up. So something's going to happen. And all of this, all of the four elements are going to come together so he can be revealed. Okay, you follow me so far? What happens first? They gather the tares. And you know this story, the parable of the wheat and the tares. The wheat was sown first, but the enemy, who's the enemy? I would say it's uh, whoever put this nasty symbol on top of this book they called Bible. I would say the enemy is whoever invented this taco game. I'd say the enemy is uh, whoever wrote A Course in Miracles and who wrote Quantum Spirituality and Fat Albert Pike and Joe Smith and all, I mean, all this stuff. That's the enemy, okay? The enemy comes in and sows tares in amongst the wheat. And so what's going to happen is there's going to come a time when the tares are all going to be gathered together and put them in bundles. We're going to make them all into one. And then we're going to burn them. Then we'll gather the wheat. So think about, think about what Jesus said. You've seen this before, haven't you? One world, one magazine. That's from the Free Will Baptist former denomination I used to belong to. One world, one ocean. One religion, one, the, the address of the Freedom Tower. Think about that. It's called One World Tower. That's its address, One World Tower. Because the two towers were scattered all over the place. But they took elements of the two towers and put them together to make the one tower. That's what they did. Xbox One magazine telling us to evolve. Now I'm going to show you a picture of what this evolution and binding together and gathering everything together into a big bundle so that this can rise out of it. I'm going to show you what it looks like. I've talked about this before and I'm going to use it in the context of of what we've been talking about as far as the four elements are concerned. And I, and I hope that you're starting to get the picture now of what's going on here. This is called a fasces. It's where the idea of fascism comes from. The fasces is like this ancient symbol. It's on the back of the dime, 10 cent piece in American coinage. We're used to seeing it. This particular graphic here, this particular picture here, 
That was taken in the um, halls of Congress. That's what the symbol for our nation, something like that, they say. Because we are the not divided states yet. We are the United States. And so the idea of gathering sticks together and putting them in a bundle and an axe head jumps out of there, I guess they think that's what America represents because that's what that is. It is a gathering of sticks and they're twined together by these spiral ropes. Think about that. And an axe head sticking out of it because if you try to chop the tree down with just one stick, you're going to break the stick. But if you bind it all together now, it's unbreakable, isn't it? See, that's the concept that they, they want to get you. Now, I'm going to show you this. This symbol, I'm going to show it to you from this book. Get ready. Numbers chapter 15, verse 32. While the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. Think about the prophecy here. He didn't do it on the first day, the second day, or the third, fourth, fifth day. He didn't do it on the sixth day. What day did he do it on? The seventh day. The day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Six thousand years from Adam until somewhere right in here where we're living now. And we're about ready to go into the Sabbath day. So here is a prophecy of the gathering of the sticks on the seventh day. Watch it. So they gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day, and they found him gathering uh, sticks, brought him unto Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation, and they put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the king. I, I, loved, I loved just reading the stories of the Old Testament because you see the prophecies. Here's a man who's gathering the sticks on the seventh day. And they bring him to a ward. You know what that is? Prison. Where does the beast come from? Prison. He's in the pit. That's what it is. It's the prison. So they put him in the prison. And they're going to they're gonna put him to death. Why? How or how are they going to do it? Think of Daniel chapter 2. What is it that destroys the, the, um, the fourth kingdom? And all the kingdoms that come before. What is it that destroys them? Stone flying through the air landing on it and destroying it. That's what stoning them was. St they didn't just like stack stones on him. Stones went flying through the air and killed this man. This was a prophetic picture of what's going on in the last day. So we have the gathering of the sticks. Now we're going to look at a story about the axe head that comes out of the sticks. Let's look at it here. Second Kings chapter 6. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head, think about what the symbol of the fasces looks like. It's got an axe head in it. The axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in the and thither. And look at what happened. The iron did swim. So the iron was buried down in the waters, peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. And something happened, and then the iron rose up out of the waters. The iron. Daniel chapter 2, the iron kingdom. By the way, you know what's at the core of the earth? Molten iron. That's why we have magnetism. That's why we have North and South Pole. Okay? That's why we have gravity. You know what's in the core of every star in the universe? Iron. Iron from here, iron from there. They're going to come together. But that's where the axe comes from. It comes floating up out of the water, just like the beast, Revelation chapter 13. So watch this. Jeremiah 51. Listen to what God said. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. For with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. And with thee will I break in pieces the horse and his rider. Think of Revelation chapter 6. And with thee will I break in pieces the chariot and his rider. 
With thee also will I break in pieces man and woman, and with thee will I break in pieces old and young, and with thee will I break in pieces the young man and the maid. I will also break in pieces with thee the shepherd and his flock, and with thee will I break in pieces the husbandman and his yoke of oxen, and with thee will I break in pieces captains and rulers, and notice that I've counted these, and there's exactly 18 things there that God is going to use the axe to chop this whole world up into pieces because a nation or a kingdom divided against itself cannot what? Stand. Think of the ten toes. Think of the ten toes. Notice this, this, this passage is full of opposites. Um, old and young, man and maid, shepherd and flock, husbandman and yoke of... They're all opposites. Iron, miry clay. And they're divided against each other. That's how you know that the devil's kingdom will not stand. Some people say, well, I think the New World Order, they're all getting together. They're all on the same page, aren't they? Like the Freemasons and the Vatican and the, and the, and the, the Muslims are all on the same page. They're all working. No, they're not. No, they're not. They're all divided against each other. Oh, there's a spirit that's collectively working. But I guarantee you, there's no honor among these thieves. That's how we know that the devil's kingdom will not stand in the last days because they are all divided against one another. But these are all divided. <clears throat> They're going to be, God's going to use the axe, the Antichrist, to divide all these nations in pieces. Eighteen things here. What do I get out of that? Number one, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18 here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. Did you know that six plus six plus six is 18? Very interesting here. Now watch this, Matthew chapter 3, verse 10. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Think this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 there, and, and 2. There are two trees in the midst of the garden. One is a tree of life, and the other one is a tree of knowledge of good and evil. It is not good fruit. The purpose of the acts, the purpose of this last day's kingdom, is to bring the destruction in upon itself. And the axe is laid to the root of the trees, and every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit cast into the fire. John chapter 15, verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them. See the gathering? Men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Acts chapter 4 verse 26. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. There's four things here. We're gathered together. Did you see that? Herod, Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. Isn't that something? Right, right. You're going to go back and reread this whole Bible again, aren't you? Because there is so much in here that is revealing to us what is going on. And we, and, and our ministry... We try to make it simple for you. So God blessed us with this dear saint writing us some software. It's called Pure Bible Search Software. Go to purebiblesearch.com or just type that in at Google and go download it for Linux, Mac, Windows. We're working on getting it on the tablets and it's free of charge. And then you just take words like gather, together, gathering, gatherings. Look, at, look through the whole scriptures. Find out what the whole Bible says about that. You'll find these verses. That's how I found them. Okay? Uh, it's absolutely amazing. But here's, here's what's going on. Okay? God is teaching you that there is a gathering coming. And that gathering is going to piece together all the pieces of the new world order. And this is actually the plan of God. God's in it. Remember what Jesus, that parable that Jesus told when it's time, we're, together, we're going to gather together first all the tares. We're going to bundle them together. And instead of like throwing them one at a time into the fire, that takes forever. We're going to take the whole bundle, throw it in all at once. 
And if you know anything about scriptures, you know as well as I do that there's a time coming. We're going to see this. There's a time coming when God literally is going to gather together all the people in the world and in one big giant flaming defeat, he's going to cast them all into the lake of fire. That's what he's going to do. But notice Acts chapter 4, notice the conspiracy. There is a conspiracy. He's quoting from Psalm chapter 2. The kings of the earth take counsel together, and the, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And here in Acts chapter 4, by way of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost has given you more light upon what this verse means. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. And, and, he, and, he, and he mentions Herod, Pontius Pilate, Gentiles, people of Israel. The four, earth, air, fire, and water, the elements, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, gathered together against Jesus Christ and against his kingdom. And since they're gathered together, God says, oh, we've made this easy. <laughs> Throws them into the fire. Acts chapter 28. Here's a, here's a picture. Remember, there's pictures all through the Bible. God gives us the doctrine, gives us the prophecy, and then he draws a picture of what it looks like. And so we go, that's what it looks like. Have you, ever, have you ever done this? Have you ever read like some novel and had it in your mind how it was? And then they made a movie out of it. They spent like $28 billion making the movie with all these special effects and everything like that. And you watch it and you're going, oh, no, that's not, who, that's not how I had that at all. No, no, they've, I, I've read the book. They ruined the book. You ever done that? Okay. Well, God wants, just wants to make sure that you draw the right picture when you read his word. So he draws the pictures for you. Watch this. What happened to Paul? Now, you gotta, let's do a little background. Jesus actually told his disciples... He said, um, I'm going to give you power to tread on scorpions and snakes, and uh, if one of them snakes happens to bite you, it won't kill you. And he said, nothing that the devil does will be able to harm you in the last days. Guess what happened to old Peter? Look at this. Acts chapter 28, verse 3. When I said Peter, I meant Paul. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, you see it? The gathering and the sticks, the fasces, and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat. Fastened on his hand. Stop right here. What happened? When Paul, when Paul gathered, gathered all it together, a beast came out of there. You say, well, Pastor, it says a viper. I'll show you in a minute. When he gathered all the sticks together, a beast came out of them. See it? Now watch this. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast... Hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he had escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Here's what I think. I think God has this judgment waiting for a long time, like he told Jude. And I think God is, has been wanting to judge this beast for a long time. And so God brings about a situation where now the beast comes out. And he comes out, and what does John see him do in Revelation 17? Came, he ascendeth out of the bottomless pit and goeth where? Into perdition, destruction, lake of fire. It's like comes right out and right into the fire. And that's what happened here. That beast came out of the bundle, landed on Paul. Paul said, ah, whoosh, whoosh, and flipped him off into the fire. And no hurt was on Paul, just exactly the way Jesus said. Now, I know there's people, East Tennessee, Kentucky, places like that, West Virginia, that they think that God told them to take up snakes. God did not tell them to take up snakes. He said, if it happens then it won't harm you. Here's what I see. I believe the scriptures. Oh, I do. I think there's something far worse and far more real and far more deadly than just an earthly snake biting somebody, even though I don't want anything to do with snakes. 
I think the fiery darts of the devil being thrown at people, and unless you have a shield of faith that every word in this book is right, that fiery dart will pierce you and destroy you for all of eternity. Can Christians be bitten by snakes and die? Yes, they still go to heaven. But the fiery darts of the serpent, the enemy, going into a person's life, fiery dart, those, that's false doctrine. That's the poison of ass. That's the vine of Sodom. Making people drunk. We've talked about that. That goes into somebody, makes them drunk, and there are no drunkards in heaven. Let's just kind of think about that. Let's look some more at it. Now watch this. We're going to remember there's the battle called Armageddon, and that's the prophecy. And of course, God drew a picture of it in your Bible. Numbers chapter 16. And Korah, look at what he did. He gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. Korah. I did a little study one time. Did you know that Korah and Moses were first cousins to each other? Go, go dig it out. You'll see it. Okay? They were kinfolk, both from the tribe of Levi. And let's see, how did it work? They had the same grandpa. They were first cousins. Okay? So Korah, he's a type of the Antichrist. He gathers all the congregation against the Lord and against his anointed. Just like in Psalm 2, just like in Acts 4, that's what Korah does. Numbers 16, 31. And it came to pass as he had made the end of speaking all these words that the ground clave asunder that was under them and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertain unto Korah and all their goods. Four things. Um, swallowed them up, their houses, all that appertain to Korah and their goods. You're, you're going to start counting things in the Bible, aren't you? Uh, they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. That is a picture of the battle of Armageddon. Revelation chapter 9, verse, or excuse me, 19, verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. That's exactly what happened to Korah. Korah was still in the process of breathing God's air when he got swallowed up down into the fire. He was sucked up alive. All right. That's a picture. God draws the pictures to show you what's happening. Korah and his gain saying. And you take that then and put it in the perspective of what Jude was talking about and 2 Peter was talking about. <clears throat> they're, they're both talking about the false teachers of the last days who are likened to the gainsaying of Korah. So what is the goal of all these false Bibles, witchcraft in the church, New Age techniques and ideas and masonry and Joe Smith religion and, and uh, Charles Taze Russell with his, there's a new truth in this. Where is the goal of all of this? It's to bring everybody together against the Lord and against his anointed to make the fasces, the bundle of sticks with the axe head sticking out of it. That's the goal of it. That's the purpose. That's the plan. Joshua chapter 9, verse 1, it came to pass when all the kings which were on this side, Jordan, in the hills and in the valleys and in all the coasts of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite heard thereof that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one Accord. So here we have, it's another picture, the book of Joshua. The Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Peribites, you know who those were? They were giants. They all, they were hybrids, right? Sons of God, daughters of men, they mingled themselves with the seed of men. That group is going to, see, I, I just think <clears throat> there's going to come a time. You know how we got all these people all over the world that call themselves Christians. I just, I really hate being people's judge. I mean, I don't like, I'm not good at it, so I try to stay out of it. I don't like for, at one time, 
I was really into a lot of this stuff over here and would have gone farther had God not pulled me out of it. So I think there's still some good people that have been fishing and over here and at some point God's going to dry it up for them and they're going to say, you know what, maybe, maybe it is better over here. We're finding those people all the time every week with this ministry. A guy called me today and said, Pastor, he said, my brother-in-law just got rid of his false Bible and he said, read the King James now. I love it. Get, hey, God's still working, all right? God is still working. God is still moving. But here's, here's what's going to happen. I think there's still time to rescue some of these people, so we're not really at war yet. But there's going to come a time when all of this stuff is going to be gathered together to make the terror warrior, the, the new God, that his function and his goal is so that it's going to come a time when it's going to be known who's on whose side. It's going to be just as easy to spot as it was in the plain of Dura. What did they do in the plain of Dura? They reared an image up and Nebuchadnezzar gathered everybody together. And while they're all standing, you don't know who's who. Wait till it's time to start playing the music, people. Then you'll know. Because all of these people are going to fall. And God's people are going to be out there in the midst of them. Are we the only ones standing? Yeah? Good. We're not falling down to that. I think, I think there's going to come a time, even though we don't know who's who right now, I think there's going to come a time when it's going to be known. My hope, my faith, is not in any man, any denomination, any of man's creeds. I have put all my confidence and all of my hope right here and I'm not moving I'm not straying I'm not going anywhere you're not going to talk me out of it so while everybody else falls for that image if I'm the only one with a couple other people standing that's what I'll do I'd like for you to stand with me but anyway they're going to gather themselves to fight with one accord because they think that if they can get more people on their side, that they can beat Jesus. That's what they think. Joshua 10, 5. Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their host, and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. Think of the five. Think of what that connects to. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Remember the five loaves? And with the with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. See the gathering? And then the, uh, the fifth trumpet sounding. And a star falling from heaven and opening the bottomless pit and the locusts coming out for five months. Think about that. The five kings gathering everybody together. Amos 2.9. Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like, light, uh, like the height of the cedars. You know who I think these five kings were? The five kings of the Amorites? I think they were giants. I think they were hybrids, sons of God, daughters of men, giants. And they were gathering all the people. I think that has everything to do with it. Um, and it relates to the, the ten toes, iron mixed with miry clay. Judges chapter 4. Here's another picture of that iron kingdom. And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Herosheth of the Gentiles unto the river Kishon. Look what happened to poor Sisera. Sisera gathers, he's got 900 chariots of iron, he represents the iron kingdom. He gathers all the people together, but what happens? The woman defeated him. Romans 16, may the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet. Shortly. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it under the ground for he was fast asleep and weary so he died. I love that story. It's one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. First Samuel 17. This is about Goliath. Who was he? A giant. Sons of God. Daughters of men. That's who he was. 
And he had the Philistines who had five lords. Go read it. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5. Uh, that's a connection to the five kings of the Amorites in Joshua chapter 10. This number keeps showing up, doesn't it? Okay. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's what it connects to. 1 Samuel 17. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, which means they were trespassing. And pitched between Shoko and Ezekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Remember, he's got sixes on him. And he's a giant. He's the son of God. He is the fourth kingdom in bodily form. He is this right here. That's who Goliath represents. The, the, and he's got, and he's, he's got sixes on him. We're going to see that. But I want you to notice that here's the Philistines on this side, on this mountain, and God's people on this mountain. There's a difference, isn't there? And there's a wide space that separates them, as there should be. But what is between them? A valley. What does Armageddon mean? It is the Har-Megiddon. It is the valley of Megiddo. They're going to meet in the valley. So here we have the gathering of the Philistines led by the terror warrior. And we have the gathering of God's people led by just a little shepherd. I love it. I love these stories because I know who wins all of them. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. Ben Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together. And there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. Did, did you see that? I told you we'd see it again. Here we have, and you can count, there's four things here. We have Ben Hadad, thirty two kings, horses, chariots. Go back. Keep this chariots thing in mind. First of all, study chariot or chariots all through the scriptures. Then go watch a video we made last year called UFOs, Chariots of the Beast. You'll see it. Do I believe in UFOs? I'll put it this way. I believe in fourth dimensional chariots according to this book. That's what I believe. Okay? But anyway, watch this. Remember, we said 32. You go back to uh, Genesis chapter 10, and we have all of the families of the earth in the 32 verses. And I think that number's there for a meaning. There's another number here, and I haven't, haven't talked about it yet. You'll have to wait on it. But that idea of the 32 plus Ben Hadad, the king of Syria, I think, I think he may have been a giant too. Can't prove it, but watch this. I'm going to show you this verse. In fact, I got to do this. First, before I show you what it looks like, 1 Kings chapter 20, go read this. Because you see, Ben Hadad and all of his 32 kings, they actually fight against Israel twice. The first time, they fight against Israel on a hill. Where was Christ died? Where was he crucified? Where did the mighty captain of the host, Jesus Christ, fight and defeat his enemies the first time? On a hill. And then you go read in 1 Kings 20 again. After that, they said, well, yeah, I mean, anybody could have beat us on a hill. <laughs> we're going to meet him down in the valley because that's where we're used to fighting. So you come down to us in the valley and we'll get you then. And guess what happened? They went down into the valley, Har Megiddo, Valley of Megiddo, Armageddon, and the Israelites wiped the floor up with them again. They got defeated twice. First time up on a hill. Second time down in a valley. This, this Bible, this Bible, this, all of these other Bibles in comparison and together, 
pale in comparison to the beauty that's in this book. The accuracy. But here's what it looks like. The Jews have a symbol for this. The king of Syria and the 32 that are gathered with him. Here's what it looks like. It's the Sephiroth. It's the tree of life. Watch this. See the man there? Doesn't that kind of look like Jesus a little bit? It's supposed to. It's actually it's supposed to look like what everybody thinks Jesus looks like, but we don't know. Well, I know what Jesus looks like now because I read the Bible. And I think all of God's people who read this book are going to know the difference between the real one and the fake one. This is the fake one. You know why? You know why I know? Because he is good and evil brought together. That's what that is. Okay? You have, and I taught you this last week, you have the Sephiroth. This is the Jewish, they call it the tree of life, but actually it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because good and evil are opposites and they're all together in the same fruit. And that's what this is. You have the male, female. You have, you have in this tree, look at here. You have in this tree, you have Yahweh and Shekinah, which is the masculine God and the feminine God that he's going to mate with. That's what this tree represents. It's not tree of life. It's tree of knowledge of good and evil. And out of this tree comes the Adam Kadmon, or the perfect man, or whatever that is. See, it's hard for me to follow. I don't remember it all. But anyway, in this tree of life, notice it. See all these lines going from these circles? There's 22 of those. You know what that is? 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, but it's also the 22 codons that make the amino acids of DNA. DNA is written out with Hebrew letters. 22 of them. So here are the 22 that represents the humans and the 10 circles are 10 divine beings and they're all fused together in this little happy new little man thing that is the God of the Kabbalah. This is Ben Hadad with his 32 kings fighting against Jesus and us. We win. We've already won. The cross won the battle already. I mean, anyway, that's what that looks like. Here's another one. Here's another picture of this. Remember, this is all, this is all the gathering. We're going to gather all of the people together so we can make the unum, the united one. That's who we're going to make. Here's a picture of it. The United Nations. All of the, and remember, Genesis 10 has the nations divided in 32 verses. So, we have all the nations. This is Syria, and this is England, this is Russia, and this was all of Ukraine, but part of it went into Russia now, and by the way, just I want to throw this in. I'm going to preach this at a conference this weekend. Actually, it would have been last weekend by the time this comes out. We'll have it on DVD for you. But it just dawned on me that the Russian government has the exact, exact same symbol as Freemasonry, double-headed eagle. I think there's something going on in this world, don't you? Okay. Anyway, here's all the nations scattered. And they all need to be united. Okay? Look at this symbol of the United Nations again. See the sections? I counted them. Out in the periphery, there's exactly 32 sections. Exactly. That is Genesis 10, the 32 verses where all the families, the nations, that's what it says there, the nations were divided in those days. Now the goal of the United Nations is to bring them all back so that the 33rd part, which is in the center, which is in the North Pole. We did a video on this one called The Secret of the United Nations or something like that. And I talk about that, how, the, how everything's going to come from the North Pole. That's where it's coming from. But anyway, the 32 are gathered together with the one coming out of it. That's what the United Nations represents. Trying to bring everybody together 
so we can have unity. And I want to tell you something. God wants it to happen. Oh, it's bad. It's terrible that, oh, that we're losing our sovereignty in this country. It's awful that that's happening. I mean, I don't like this world we live in. It's so, all this is evil. But as saints of the Most High God, we trust Him. We trust His Word. We know that God has not lost the battle for America. Oh, no, 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 no. God wants it all gathered together. Because after all, He sent angels down and says, you know what? Gather them all together. Let's get them all one big happy family. So what we can do what? Cast them into the fire forever. It's the will of God. It's God's plan. It's God's mission. He's going to gather together these people. He's going to gather together these people. You have to decide whose side you're going to be on. So, when they bring out in your church the elements children's worship program book, you go, we're not going to be part of that. They hand your child a Del Taco thing where you're going to put together the elements and build the terror warrior. You can say, we're not going to do that. We're not part of that. Absolutely not. When you see all of this witchcraft and all these things that I'm trying to show you, when you see these things going on, you have but one choice to make, and that is how quickly can we get out of Babylon? Because that's exactly what that is. And just because people don't get it, and your neighbors and your family and your friends, they may ridicule you, you don't have to make a big deal. If you can't explain it well, just leave in silence, but just say, look, I can't explain it, but I'm trying to follow the Word of God. Don't tell them you follow Mike Hoggard. Who am I? I'm nobody. You follow this book. You let the book convict you. But if you're following this book and it doesn't sound right where you are, whether it's the restaurant you go to, the civic organization you're part of, the church or denomination that you're part of, or the public school that you're in, you just very quietly say, you know what, I have to leave. I can't be a part of this. And you leave. They're, they're going to hate you. They're going to call you names. They're going to do all kinds of things. But you say, you know what, it's coming down. It's getting very serious nowadays. And I just have to stick with my convictions and stick with the Word of God. And that's what you do. That's what I encourage you to do. And you have to decide whose side am I going to be on. Because the reason why all of this is gathering together, the reason why the, the purpose-driven church and the Roman Catholic Church and every, the, um, the Christian, the chris Lam community and the, the Promise Keepers and all of the organizations are trying desperately to bind together all of the religions in the world is so that God can form them in the body. That's why it's happening. And you know what? I don't like fire any more than you do, and I want to stay far, far away from that fire. So I think you can do it. All right, God bless you. We are going to... I don't know, I may take a rest for a while, but I'm working on a new project based on this, the Great Seal of the United States of America. What does it represent? We'll be bringing that to you shortly. All right, God bless you. Thank you for watching. We'll see you the next time. Bye-bye.